Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for weekly updates about my podcasts, events, and more. Also, follow me on Instagram at zibbyowens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And finally, join my virtual book club called Zibby's Virtual Book Club, which meets every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time until 3 p.m. and features half an hour of book club discussion followed by 30 minutes of Q&A with the author whose book we've just discussed. You can sign up on my website, zibbyowens.com, under the virtual book club section, or even on Instagram under the link in my bio. I hope you'll find me in all these different channels and enjoy this podcast. Hi, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I have an anthology coming out called Moms Don't Have Time 2, a quarantine anthology. And it comes out on February 16th and has essays by 60 plus of the authors who have been on this podcast. So first of all, please pre-order this book. I think you will love it. I'm so excited about all the authors who are represented. Um, Just to give you a few, um, Chris Bajalian, uh, Jewel Parker Rhodes, Ashley Prentice Norton, Gretchen Rubin, Rima Zaman, Eileen Zimmerman, and that is just from the first page of the multi-page table of contents. So please pick up this book, Moms Don't Have Time To, a quarantine anthology. It's available anywhere you buy books, Amazon, bookshop.org, and your local independent bookstore. So please pick up a copy. And also, I want to invite you listeners to my um, fundraiser slash launch party the night it comes out on February 16th, a Tuesday at 7 p.m., Bookhampton and the Children's Museum of the East End are co-hosting it for me. And 50 of the authors who wrote essays in this book, as well as many of the amazing authors who blurbed this book, um, who wrote little praiseworthy quotes at at the front, will be there. And you can be there too. So if you go to my website, zibbyowens.com, and just click on Anthology and go to Book Tour, you will see um, a whole fundraiser section. And for $50, um, you can attend. You'll get a copy of the book, and you'll get to schmooze on Zoom with all of these amazing authors. This is like going to be the literary happening of February. So please come. I would love to see you all in person on Zoom, I guess, but even see some of your faces. I know so many of you are really loyal listeners, and that makes me really happy. All proceeds of the book and the fundraiser are going to the Susan Felice Owens Program for COVID-19 Vaccine Research at Mount Sinai Health System. And it is named after my husband's mother, who passed away from COVID over the summer, which many of you followed along on Instagram as I uh, recounted that horrific experience. So all the proceeds are going there. The cost includes the price of a book. So thank you for supporting this effort and for supporting my book. I can't wait to see you there. Today's episode has been sponsored by This Is Everything with Ali Levine, a podcast hosted by Hollywood mom, celebrity stylist, influencer, and Bravo reality star, Ali Levine. On her podcast, you'll get a mix of, well, everything from motherhood to fashion, lifestyle, spiritual being, all totally real and raw. You have to listen. Ali interviews celebrities, experts, entrepreneurs, and so much more. Tune in weekly to be uplifted, empowered, inspired, and truly entertained. Hi, everybody. Today is day three of the February Book Blast, and it is Literary Fiction Wednesday. So I hope you enjoy all of these authors and interviews. Sometimes so many collect that I have to just blast out a bunch all at once, and that's what this week is all about. So if you missed Memoir Monday or Nonfiction Tuesday, you can go back and listen to those. And coming up is New Novels Thursday and Family Theme Memoirs Friday. So listen as much as you can. Lauren Fox is the author of Send For Me. Lauren earned her MFA from the University of Minnesota and is the author of the novels Days of Awe, Friends Like Us, and Still Life with Husband. Her work has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, Marie Claire, Parenting, Psychology Today, The Rumpus, and Salon. She lives in Milwaukee with her husband and two daughters. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much for having me. I am so excited to discuss Send For Me because this book is gorgeous and heartbreaking and just so great. It's so well written and it was just really, really great. So anyway, I loved it. I really loved it. So tell listeners, if you don't mind, a little about Send For Me and 
what inspired you to write it and what it's about and all the good stuff. All the good stuff. So short answer is that it is about a family, four generations of women starting in Germany, kind of on the cusp of World War II, and then jumping ahead in time to present day, well, Milwaukee in the 90s. And it's about family separation and kind of the twin traumas of the Holocaust and that family rupture. It's about I don't know if I think that there's a main character, but I kind of think of Annalise as the main character in the book. And she is, as the Nazis are coming to power in the 1930s, she is able to leave Germany with her husband and young daughter, but she has to leave her parents behind. And the book is kind of about, partly about her parents desperately trying to leave Germany and how she in Milwaukee is trying to have a life there and trying to bring her parents over. And then the contemporary timeline is about Annalise's granddaughter, Claire, who discovers a stash of letters in her parents' basement that were written by Annalise's mother, Clara, to Annalise as they were trying to leave Germany. And how Claire, the granddaughter, is kind of trying to live her life and trying to figure out how to pry herself away from her history and trying to figure out how to be in the world knowing her family's intense and traumatic history. Oh my gosh. And I understand that you actually found the letters. I shouldn't say understand. It's like written in the book, but you yeah. found the le- <laughs> you found the letters that your grandmother, well, tell, tell the whole story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other half of the question is what inspired me to write the book. And that is what inspired me to write the book. So it's fiction. It's very much fiction. All the characters are, you know, sort of a mishmash of my family, but also just, you know, I mean, I'm a fiction writer there. I made them up. So, Mm -hmm. but the story is my family's story. And when I was in my twenties, I found letters in my parents' basement. My grandparents had recently died. They had been living with us for years. And then all, so all of their their belongings were in my parents' basement. And I was going through them one day and I found, I still remember this moment so specifically, it was a little brown box with a pink ribbon around it. And in it were about 75 letters written on this crumbling onion skin paper. They were in German, but they were also in this German script that I can't describe it. It's like knife scratches on paper. It's just like up and down. You can't, it's, it's an old fashioned German script that hardly anyone can still read. So I found these letters and I just knew like this moment stands out for me so vividly in my memory. I just knew that they were going to be important. I just, it was almost kind of magical. I just knew that these letters were going to answer, were kind of going to be like a key to unlock questions that I had had growing up. I knew my family's history because I live in the world and I knew about, I mean, I learned about the Holocaust, but they really didn't talk about it. They were really, I think, you know, trauma affects people in different ways. Some people process and talk about it. And in my family, you know, they just, I, my family was so tight and so loving and so connected, but they just did not, my, my grandparents gave me little snippets of information throughout my life. I can count on one hand the number of times they talked about it. So I was able to get these letters translated. It's kind of a process, but I was a graduate student at the University of Minnesota and I sort of stumbled on a professor who knew how to, he, he was in the German department and he had survived the war he was half Jewish and he had survived the war in Berlin passing. So he's a whole, that was a whole nother story. But so he took personal interest in my story and helped me translate the letters. So it took us about a year. I would go into his office once a week with a couple of letters and he would read them out loud into a little tape recorder. And then I would go home and transcribe them. So that is the inspiration for this book. It was really immersive. It was a really immersive project. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And then you tried, you you wrote in the letter in the book to readers that you tried to write it as memoir and then waited almost 20 years and now you've come out with it as fiction. Yes. What was it like writing it as memoir versus like, now I want to read, by the way, the memoir version. I don't want to read it. Well, maybe (laughs) no one will read that. (laughs) I don't care if it's good or not. I just like, I want to know more about your family after reading this. And no, these were the actual letters though, right? That you interspersed. Yeah. So how is their story different? <laughs> so it's different in so many ways. And it's also like the emotional foundation of the story is is the same. <laughs> the, this is insignificant, but my grandparents, my grandmother's family owned a butcher shop. Okay. And my grandfather was a cattle dealer. So that's how they met. And I, <laughs> I've been a vegetarian my whole life. I was like, I'm not writing about a butcher shop. So I put it, I placed it in a bakery instead. It was much more fun to research, <laughs> but that's not, I mean, that's not the significant way the story is different, but you know, fiction writers are, I always say fiction writers are like magpies, just kind of like grabbing objects from, you know, bright, shiny objects, wherever they see them. Like, so it's such a weird thing to describe the process of taking a true story and fictionalizing it. Because I felt like, you know, in a world where 
there is such a thing as Holocaust denial, I felt a very strong obligation to tell this story as to tell it truthfully. So I promised myself I would not change a word of the letters. So in the process of reading them, transcribing them, editing them, every word of my great grandmother's in the book, in my novel is true. Those are her words. Other than that, like in order to sort of, you know, get into my character's heads, I had to give myself full permission to imagine them. So, I mean, I, you know, I guess basically the long and the short of it is the outline of my family's story is absolutely true. And then all the details are, you know, a combination of true and fiction and research and, you know. Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm, glad you, I'm glad you changed it to the bakery because those were some of my favorite scenes uh, <laughs> and all different confections. And I feel like you should, if maybe you've already done this or whatever, but like in conjunction with the launch of your book, you need to make all those things and like Take- oh no, I I do not. <laughs> you don't? <laughs> no, not me. Okay, you Someone need to else. <laughs> source. Let me rephrase. You need to find all of those things and like have them yeah. all displayed. Because now I want to go see what all of those like the, the different confections that you referred to throughout the book. I want to know what they my, all look like. And my grandma was a, a a really good baker. My kids are like, you know, mom. The reason your stuff doesn't turn out is because you're always like, oh, that won't matter. Like I'm, I did not inherit <laughs> her talent. <laughs> I know. I'm like, well, we don't have buttermilk. Let me just Google and see what I can throw. Oh, together. you can make buttermilk. I, <laughs> I've done it. Yes, I've done it too. <laughs> I made brownies the other day, and we didn't have any vegetable oil, so I used avocado oil. See, that's not good. No, it tasted. It <laughs> I was, would do the same. My thing. kids were like, oh, what's wrong with these brownies? And I'm like, you're like nothing. I'm They're like, great. Hey, you got some extra <laughs> healthy fat in there. I don't know. Oh my God, they were terrible. I threw them away. <laughs> yes, some substitutions do not work, but right. <laughs> like you, I probably, the urge to bake does not come with a lot of forethought. It's just like, let's do it right now with whatever we have. So yeah. <laughs> and that's a, exacerbated by the pandemic. Like I'm not going to the grocery store. So what does this make do with this rancid butter that I just found? <laughs> yeah, totally. We'll just wait for the next delivery exactly. food from Restaurant <laughs> in a few days. <clears throat> wow. Well, okay. So fine. You do not have to bake all these things now. I take it. Thanks. No, yeah. problem. no problem. <laughs> well, what was it like writing this book? Because you're, first of all, the words, and I dog-eared all these different sections just to show like how great you are at even just describing things. Let me find any of my, oh gosh, when you, okay. So when you were talking about the heartbreak with Annalise and Max at the very beginning of the book, you talk, so this is just a scene where in a teenage love, a guy decides he doesn't love someone, right? This is like not that big a deal. And yet you write it in such a way. Let me read a couple lines. Two days ago, she was a perfect composition of face and limbs and breath and heart. Now she's a ragdoll, lumpy, mismatched, stitched together and stuffed with old cloth. And then she keeps going and you say, this moment is nothing really. So basically she wanted to touch his hand and he kind of pulled it away. This moment is nothing really. Her heart will mend, even as she can practically feel it cracking. She has an inkling that it will eventually glue itself back together. Maybe it's even starting right now, the delicate process of repair. This is not a devastation like the ones that will follow. Nothing like those great gasping winged monsters of ruin that will come later. The ones that will try to pick her up in their claws and fling her to her death. It's nothing like those, obviously, but still... Years from now, in another country, with her handsome husband, this life irrevocably left behind her. She will remember it. The smell of coffee beans and cigarette smoke, the clink of dishes, and the laughter drifting over from other tables, the sudden rearrangement of their relationship reflected in Max's face. Ah, so good. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) Let me find one from later. Oh, that was funny about the polar bears, by the way. My daughter has like a fascination with polar bears. Oh, I like when you said, this is much later, but you said, how could you know the heart of your beloved before you married him? Courtship was a confection. I love that line. Courtship was a confection. Crisis brought out the best in people or the very worst. And then you went on to say more, but what a line. I mean, all of these lines, like, you know, it's funny when I pick up a book from Knopf, I know that it's going to be beautiful, right? Like I know the language is going to be literary and beautiful and I'm going to like cling to every description of a detail. But this was like, just so great. Thank you. Anyway, so tell me more about your writing. I keep looking because I kind of want to read another passage, but I can't decide. And now I just want to sit here and have you read to me from my book. This is weird. (laughs) (laughs) It's very satisfying. (laughs) Oh, I love this too. Let me just read this one passage. This is also about, so interesting as we talk about like men needing to be strong emotionally and 
you know, this whole man up thing that people are finally, you know, rising up against essentially. But this was like ode to the tenderhearted man, which is great as I have some of those in my life. You wrote, mm-hmm. Julius knows he is tenderhearted. He comes from a long line of tenderhearted men, fathers who cry when they hold their babies for the first time, who tiptoe into darkened bedrooms just to touch the soft cheeks of their sleeping children. Husbands who at times are filled with so much lighthearted gratitude and affection for their tired and faithful wives that they will without suppression or regret pull those surprised wives into their arms and hold them for a moment. Sternness is not in his nature. Discipline is not his forte. He has never tried to be something he is not. Beautiful. I mean, Thanks. you know everything about this man now. It's just like, <laughs> it's it's great. That was easy for me. That was easy because I come from a long line of just that kind of man. My grandpa, my dad, just like really unusual men, I think, of that era. Just so soft and lovely. It's amazing. So, yeah. t- so tell me about writing and you're learning to write like this and you're writing of this particular book and just how you craft your sentences and all of that. So funny because I think about this question, you know, while I'm writing, of course, every writer is like, how will I capture this in the interview that is yet to come? (laughs) I don't, I, and and in a way, so, so I think about this all the time. And then also I have no idea, like there's some weird alchemy that happens. I mean, it's not like, it's not like it isn't a ton of work and like laborious crafting, but there's also just sort of this, like, it's the only time in my life when like, time goes by and I don't notice it is when I'm writing, you know? So it's like a weird thing to dis- to try to describe the process of writing, which I'm sure you know. But also, I mean, this story has been living with me for, you know, over two decades. So I really just gave myself permission and also just was so in the moment of this story, like more so than, this is my fourth novel, but more so than any of the the previous three, I was just so immersed in it. And I, so I don't know, the first version of this fic of this novel was, as we said, a memoir. And I really, it was composed of lots of really, really short scenes, some of which were like half a page long. And I really gave myself permission to sort of try to craft the sentences. I spent a long time on the sentence level part of the story. And that carried over to the novel. I just really gave myself, my, my last three novels were much I, mean, I wouldn't say they're lighter because they the like the last one I wrote is about a woman and her the the death of her best friend. So it's not like the subjects were lighter, but I just my writing style was like a little more contemporary and light. And so this one I just really allowed myself to write it the way I wanted to write it and craft the sentences with as much time. I mean, it took me it took my last book came out six years ago. It took me a long time to write this book. <laughs> So I don't know if I can describe it any, that's okay. like on a more, gra- I don't know if I can, t- you know, on a more granular level, because in some ways it's just a, a distant memory. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Well, where did you like to write and did you outline it? How did, like, how did you structure the story? I always outline because it gives me this sort of like probably false confidence, but I feel like if I outline up the plot, then at least I know step-by-step step where I'm going, I'm, you know, free to change it, but at least I have a, a map. Is that, I, I forgot the first part okay. of your question. <laughs> and also like, where did you do it? Were you at where you are right now? Like at this desk or were you? Yeah, ex- exactly. Yes. <laughs> right, right here at this desk. And also just kind of back in the days when my kids were in school, not <laughs> upstairs in their bedrooms in school. I mean, I had the house to myself from, you know, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. So that was my writing time. And so I could just walk around. I mean, my floors are very clean because I would just sort of Swiffer and think. <laughs> just wander around the house, you know, pace and walk and think. And, but this right here is where in a a slightly messier version of what you see is where I write. Swiffer as ultimate writing aid. I like that. (laughs) Ode to the Swiffer. I say say coming next. (laughs) How old are your kids? They're 18 and 13. So they're all grown up now, kind of, kind of, <laughs> kind of. I have a 13 year old upstairs and two other ones work, you know, also in school. So I get it. Yeah. That's really fun. Yeah. Really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're, they're old enough to, to do it on their own, but that still sucks. Yeah. And are you working on anything else now? Mm, just, <laughs> just swiffering. No, <laughs> I am not working on anything else right now. I feel like somebody said, writing and I think it was Rick Moody who said writing a novel is like burning down your house and you have to rebuild from the ground up and I don't know I have a couple of ideas like tumbleweed floating around in my brain but right now not much else that's okay. this one was such an exorcism for me like really I mean because it's my family story and because I sat with it and it lived in my head and my heart for so long it's just it's really weird right now to feel like what's what's after this I have no idea 
But that's okay. I mean, this, <laughs> so what did your family think about this book? Because it's, it's in part like your whole family story. Yeah. My brother's just reading it now and it's just been radio silence on the other end. So I'm eager to hear what he has to say about it. My mom has read it like three or four times and she'll be like, Oh honey, I'm reading it again. And I'm crying again. Like she's, you know, she's, she's, you know, my parents are just like, Oh, what a great job you did tying your shoe. Like they would just support me no matter what. So and my mom is, I think I, I haven't, my mom and I talk all the time, but not so much about this. I think she feels really pleased that I've taken on this project. I think she feels like our family story has been honored in a way by the writing of this novel. I hope she feels that way. Well, it's true. It has. I mean, all these lost stories and yeah. time is going by. I mean, what's great about this book, and I read a lot of Holocaust era stuff. Like I love, you know, mm -hmm. I'm just as most Jewish people do are, and also just readers in general. Like I find this time period, you know, very I, I'm drawn to it and I, I, I keep trying to understand it and I never will. Right. right. I just, you know, I'm like how, well, it must be different. They must've felt different. And the thing about mm -hmm. this book is you're like, no, 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 nobody felt different at all. Like it was just like, as if we were there and you write about it, like, you know, even little things like the objects, there's one part of this book where, where Annalise is mourning, feeling guilty about it, but even mourning, like, or chandelier or something like that. Or like, how can she be so, you know, when so much has been lost, how can she mourn the beautiful things that she used to have in her life or a, a special carpet or anything? And it's like her life before was very much like, you know, lives today. I mean, like all yeah. the details you had. And I think that's one of the things I found that set this book apart is like the detail, the like, you know, you're crawling on your knees, feeling the carpet fibers type of detail versus, you know, life was fine when I walked back and forth to the bakery. I mean, that's not, that doesn't sound right. I mean, I've read a million great <laughs> other books. <laughs> I'm not trying to say anything. There was just something about how real it felt and how it could so easily be right here, right now, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm thinking a couple of things as you're saying that. One is I came back to this book when it came to light that families were being separated at the border and that children were being put in cages. And I was like, oh, this is still so relevant. Like, how is this still so relevant? But, you know, I think the fact that it's such recent history and we're still trying to, it's a futile attempt to try to figure it out, but that's what this book is, an attempt to sort of, you know, process it. It's still, I mean, the past is still with us, hasn't gone away. And and this recent past, I, I thought a lot about those like physical details because, you know, our lives are made up of those like domestic moments, you know, like the, you know, the lines of the vacuum cleaner as you, as you vacuum your rugs and the, you know, the, the beautiful lamp that you have that has, you know, a crack down the middle or, you know, our lives are made up so much of those physical details. And those really weren't any different. I think about that. I, I did so much research on this time period and really what it comes down to is it was just our lives without the technology, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think about even the ashtray with the two dogs with their backs. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Like, I feel like now I've seen that. Right? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I would be like, like if I saw it in a story, I'd be like, Oh, that's that one. You know, that's the one. Yeah. That's the one. Somebody said fiction writers aren't any more insightful than anyone else. They're just, you know, really good at observing. And I actually feel that way. I'm just like, just, I'm just looking at stuff and seeing weird things. <laughs> so that's my writing process. <laughs> but there's also this like inherited trauma, which people talk mm -hmm. about and which, you know, comes obviously from not just Holocaust era survival stories, but from many ways that people have, have had family members go through things or mm -hmm. pass things down. And it's like, when there's something around you, even if it's not spoken about, what does that do to future generations? So even the fact that Annalise's granddaughter, Claire goes through, you know, this whole moment where she's going to weddings and feeling left out and wishing, how do you find the love of your life and all of that? Maybe there's something to the heaviness that she doesn't even realize she has that she's carrying around with her and that's informing mm -hmm. everything. What do you think? I think absolutely. And I think that was the, like, I was, the, I was reluctant to write the present day character because it almost felt weirdly, like it almost felt too easy. That part, you know, the inherited trauma, like I feel that, you know, that and it's and it's kind of hard to describe because it's so much like in the air you breathe when you inherit this kind of history. So I'm just gonna pivot and talk about my personal life because so much of me is in Claire, but you know, I'm like super close to my mom and very strongly feel this obligation 
to kind of take care of her in a way, just to sort of, you know, I used to joke when I was in my 20s that all I wanted to do was move back to Milwaukee, have a couple of babies and just hand them straight over to her. But of course I wasn't joking and that is what I did. You know, like there's sort of a feeling when you inherit this kind of rupture that you want to write a new story of your own, you know? And there's the, and I tried to piece this together for years. Like what part of my sort of psychological makeup is whatever, what what part is just me and what part is, you know, what I was given. I mean, in some ways it's the same for everybody. Like what, what's the difference between who you are and like who your family is and what they gave you. And I think, you know, maybe that's just intensified for people who inherit a particularly difficult history. But I wondered it for years, like, was I just depressed or was I feeling this sort of like familial generational trauma? I mean, I guess it can be both. I don't, I still don't really know. I just think the question is really interesting. Me too. Um, I feel like it's hard to get around. I mean, it ha- it's in there, you know, like, yeah, it's just hard to sift out if we use our baker's analogy. <laughs> as we exactly. like turn that little flower thing, right? <laughs> Anyway, that's as close as I'm getting to baking today. (laughs) (laughs) Thankfully. Yeah. (laughs) Do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Sure. I tell this to, whenever I'm asked that question, I have the same answer. And I say it to myself all the time. Look up from your phone, you know, look around, pay attention. I mean, I'm always head down looking at my phone too, like we all are. But I often wonder what the next generation of writing is going to look like. Because I feel like the most important thing to do is to pay attention to the world and just be really just wide open to it, eyes and ears and all senses. So, so just look up, pay attention. And, you know, like this book has been a part of me for over two decades. There's no, like it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So just, you know, work, work, work as much as you can. I'm not, I don't write every day. I haven't, you know, I, I I would love to say that I do, but I can't and I don't, but just as much as possible, you know, put your butt in the chair and, and just, even if it's terrible, I mean, often it is, but the, you know, the writing process is not it's not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be work and you have to do it every day. Or well, you don't have to do it every day, but you have to do it as much as you can. All good advice. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> and read and read so much. I've, I've heard people say like, I'm a writer, but I don't like to read. Like you, you can't, you have to read. You have to be a part of the conversation with other writers and other readers. I, that's like my favorite. I feel like I'll take like an hour during the day and just read and be like, nope, it's my job. I have to, yeah. as you well know. I do that too. <laughs> I'm the same way. I'm like, oh yeah, sorry. I'm just gonna, you know, sit yeah. here and <laughs> it's work. Yeah, it's work. <laughs> do you have a genre you like the most? So right now I'm reading a lot of historical fiction just because that's sort of the conversation. Those, those, those are the conversations I've been having. And I was never, you know, particularly drawn to it before, but I'm loving it now. But just contempt. I mean, I love contemporary fiction. I don't, I'm so kind of Catholic in my taste. I've like one book in my office, one book in the living room and one book upstairs. So, I mean, I'll just read sort of wh- wherever I am and whatever is, whatever is good. I'm the same way. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> I mean, I've made this, I mean, I've now made this into like my, my like work or whatever, but I've been like this forever, right? There's always a book. Yeah. I don't know. It's very comforting to know that like, no matter where you are in your own life, you can escape into someone else's at a moment's notice. <laughs> Completely. And you'll never be bored. And like, yeah. you can, you know, bored, lonely, tune everything else out. Yeah. yeah. So I know it's a secret. I don't understand why everybody doesn't, you'll, you're never bored or lonely. Like, why doesn't everybody know that? I know. My kids are like, oh, we don't, I don't like to read. <laughs> I, know. Okay. I know. I asked <laughs> It's my, their rebellion. My son, who's like six and is obsessed with the iPad because obviously with COVID, right. you know, that's what happens. And I'm like, you know, you used to like to read last year. <laughs> like, and he's like, yeah, but it's not as entertaining. And it kind of broke my heart because I'm like, how can, how can a graphic novel even compete with like the bells and whistles of his video games. But anyway, just pretend you don't care. Just act like that's fine. I, well, and then he'll be like, well, maybe I should read. Yeah. He'll, well, now that, <laughs> you know, I do restrict the time somewhat. So I'm hoping that I, I don't know. I've just, I don't know about you. I've never wanted to force reading on my kids because I don't no. want it to seem like one of those things that, so I never want to be like, now you have to read, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. No, I don't either. I mean, what do you, how can you, my kids are like, they don't, well, they don't do anything I say anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> That wouldn't go over. (laughs) Good point. Good point. Very good point. Okay. Well, Lauren, it was great chatting with you. Congratulations on this beautiful novel. And I'm really excited for you. And I'm excited. I hope it finds a home with lots of people because it is quite different, I feel, than the widely written about time period. I feel like this book is 
is different. It really stands apart. So I hope people delve into it and thank your lovely women. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Well, have a great day. Thanks. You too. Bye, Lauren. Bye. Today's episode has been sponsored by This Is Everything, the podcast by Ali Levine. And just a reminder again, please pre-order a copy of my book, Moms Don't Have Time To, a quarantine anthology, and go to my website under the anthology tab for the fundraiser, and I hope you'll buy a ticket and join me for, and I should have mentioned, um, all proceeds go to COVID-19 research. So please join me for the fundraiser. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time To Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 